Hi, everyone. I'm Scott Omalonic, Scott O, the editor in chief of Inc. Welcome to Real Talk today with Damon John. As I'm sure everyone knows, uh, Damon John founded uh, the clothing brand Fubu with little more than an idea his mom's kitchen table um, and some very, very savvy marketing. He went on to become one of my favorite sharks from the television show Shark Tank, um, the Emmy winning show Shark Tank, um, and also runs his own uh, consulting and investment business. Um, he is one of very few people to have appeared on Inc. twice, but is distinguished in that he has um, sold more copies of Inc. magazine when he was on the cover than anyone um, else. He has uh, completed his uh, fifth book um, written, uh, which is more than most people read these days. He's written his fifth book, Power Shift, which you can find out uh, now. Um, Damon John, welcome uh, to Inc. Real Talk. Thanks for being here today. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Scott. Thank you so much. Uh, our, our pleasure. It's an important um, uh, time to hear from, I think, important people and people with insight um, into the culture. And I guess uh, to, to start, I'd, I'd really like to start at the beginning of the day. When you wake up now in the last two or three weeks, um, what do you wake up thinking about? What do you wake up worrying about? Well, I wake up thinking, uh, you know, like like I uh, always do. I wake up thinking about how um, blessed I am to have health and um, and good friends and a beautiful family. Um, I wake up, you know, I, and I always do this. Wake up thinking about how blessed I am to be in a in a country where voices can be heard. Um, and then I start thinking about. The immediate things that are that are around about how do I protect myself and my family uh, from the overlooming health issue, and how long will this happen? Um, I think about then you know what's going on in the streets and how I can um, be a positive influence to people of all colors and uh, and um, and how can I reach out to help friends that may need help in this time. And then I go into the business. Um, where am I? What businesses are working? What businesses are not? And my staff. And how long will I be able to keep staff in this area? And how will I be able to grow staff in this area? Uh, and uh, and and then I then I fall back asleep because I'm tired, you know, <laughs> and exhausted like everybody else. And I go if I if I go back to sleep, maybe all of this will be over and we will be back to our normal schedule. Yeah, I, I think a lot of us think that way, and of course, um, uh, that that's that's a dream, right? That's a pre-sleep dream that that would happen <laughs> yeah. to some extent. Um, uh, to be sure, you're a successful entrepreneur um, and and also a successful black man. That gives you a particular uh, place of perspective and particular place of privilege. Um, it, do you feel that you need to use that to influence the dialogue that's happening in our country right now? I do believe I, I need to do it, but before influencing the dialogue in the country, my 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 initial need was to influence my staff um, and not influence them, listen to them, because we got in this circumstance by assuming, assuming people are good or assuming people are bad or assume it's not that bad and just not necessarily listening and doing our homework. And as a true entrepreneur, um, what we normally do, what almost all entrepreneurs do who are successful, and, I, and, and even heads of companies, entrepreneurs, whatever you want to call them, I call people who are in command, what they normally do is they find that there's a problem that exists. They research how come the problem exists. We're talking about a, a product. They do their homework. Then they see what assets they need around them to tackle the job, and then they just start moving slowly into doing that. And I think that that's what I did. But I didn't want to assume that even though I have a staff and several companies that are either financed and or working for a man of color, that it was all okay, right? That everything was okay. So uh, when this really started to, to gain steam, I, I the president of my company, who happens to uh, not be African American, um, said to me, hey, you know, I, I realize that maybe I'm not doing as much as I should, but I don't know where to start. I don't know what to do. And there's a lot of questions that people may have. So we had an open forum and uh, open forum where people who may have been white or Caucasian were able to ask questions that normally they wouldn't have asked because they may have felt it was stupid. They may have felt it was demeaning. 
They may, may have felt they should know why. And then, um, uh, you know, the people of color, the blacks, the browns and, and, in, there, in, in, the, in the room got to also speak about some of their experiences and it just opened up such a dialogue. So before I go out and I'm able to do that publicly, uh, you know, I, I find that it was first my staff and then a lot of my CEO and presidents and a lot of friends of, me, uh, of, of mine called and asked, could I do that for them? And we did. And then, yes, I do get on to platforms like this amazing one where you, that you've given me uh, several times, you know, whether it be a cover or, or, or something else. And I'm here to have those conversations. So make everybody just a little bit smarter, some, uh, you know, tomorrow. Um, uh, thank you. And of course, uh, you know, we're thrilled you're here and any time for that matter. Um, what, what is the way uh, recognition it isn't change, right? And then there's a lot of agitation for change right now. Even talking isn't change, even though that's the first step. How are you going to make sure that some of the conversations you've had in your, internally with, with your stakeholders in your businesses, how do, how do you convert those to um, real differences going forward? You know, how, how do we um, operationalize um, those things? Well, it's honestly doing more homework on the, the issues in the market, systemic issues. And you know, let's be real, every time we turn around, there's another issue. We realize how tone deaf we were to something or some issue. And, uh, you know, if the women's uh, movement started in the 1960s and it took all the way 60 years for a Harvey Weinstein pig to uh, turn the conversation to saying we have to change laws in the workplace and bring people in to make sure that you are educated so that a woman does get her day in court or she does get to rise to the CEO position or she does get to feel very comfortable and you understand that you violated that. Uh, it, it's not going to be as easy with people of color because I get be very honest, every one of us has a woman or know a woman I like because you probably wouldn't exist if you didn't know a woman because she gave birth to you. So with being insensitive to that aspect for so many years, think every one of us doesn't know a person of color. Every one of us didn't necessarily grow up in the hood. So there's a lot of education that needs to happen prior to making the steps. Now, the education just needs to happen when you find out, well, what is systemic racism? And I'm still learning a lot of the systemic issues that racism have. But, you know, I'll give you an example. If, if mass incarceration uh, started off, uh, you know, during the Reagan era prior to crack, uh, but you go into a town in a neighborhood, but the mass incarceration is giving people of color who are 90% of the drug violators 10 years for a $600 bag of marijuana, then that's systemic racism. Because what happens then, and, we, and I'm, I'm not going to try to go into this long thing about it, but what happens? They become a felony. They become a felon. Now, when they go to work at my company or go to a bank, they have to mark the box, felon. And no two felons are created equal. Right. They go to the bank. They can't necessarily get a loan. Felon. Right. Even if they get out of jail and they're just on welfare. Felon. They may not even get that. So what happens. Right. So it's about the education. So what. And then also when most of my companies started off as interns, they were in school and they start off as interns. And here's where I can make a change. Of course, I'm getting interns from the best schools in the world. Why am I not looking in different pools for interns to give them the same shot who may be of color. So I do, I got to do a couple of things. I got to look at the felony marks. Uh, and, 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 and if somebody is of uh, what I think is a good standard, I need to check that out and have a little bit more uh, of an open mind to listen. If I'm going out after interns, we need to give certain other uh, good schools, uh, you know, or, or not even good schools, meaning just good kids you know, opportunities. And these are the small steps that I can take personally. And these are small steps that a lot of people can take. But, you know, you look at a lot, and there's a lot of great documentaries out there. If you look at a lot of the, uh, the issues behind systemic racism, you'll find that there are so many different things that are happening that you'll end up saying, wait a minute, but I can make this small change, you know, at my office internally before I even go out there. And I know a lot of people right now are saying, man, I just want to help right away. But this is, this is a marathon we're in. And I, I don't want anybody looked at as, oh my God, you're not helping. No, you're thinking about how to figure this thing out, right? And uh, you know, I just 
you know, I'm at the point of rambling now, but I'm just explaining to you a lot of things I personally have to do. And I know a lot of people is heavy on their heart and they're going to do uh, similar things, I hope, to, to move the ball forward. Sure. It, it seems, though, that at rock bottom, you're, you're taking a fairly optimistic view of this, that, that there is change possible and that it's within us to be able to affect that change. 100%. I, I absolutely believe so. Um, and you're seeing people of all beautiful colors go out into the world and say that enough is enough and they're listening. Um, and, and, and I think change is going to come. Listen, I'm not going to, why, why be negative? You know I mean? There, I'm, I'm not going to get anything out of that. <laughs> that, 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 yeah, that, that's a good point. Um, I, I think um, it, it, it's sort of the only choice, right? I mean, we don't, we, we don't have the opportunity to, to, to look at it differently. Um, I, I'm, I'm conscious of, 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 of something that is, is really generally not something most people are conscious of, and that is the, the, the flip side of, of say, say un, un, unfair sentencing or something like that, but it's just sort of everyday privilege. Right. And, and, and we've heard about um, uh, white privilege. We've heard about white male privilege. Um, uh, for people like me, I've benefited from that. Right. And, and yet I'm generally not aware of it because it's just the life I've lived. Um, how, how do you think uh, business leaders like me um, can step out of who, who they are to understand that, 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 that their experience is quite different and, and um, m might be a lot smoother because of it. Yeah, so um, again, it goes back to the homework, but it goes back to listening. And, you know, I found that, you know, when I, I have done some of these uh, leadership talks with uh, the CEOs, we would, we would find that a lot of the employees would uh, contact each other afterwards and say, you know, I have, I, I work with this beautiful African American woman that I love to death. I've been sitting next to her for 10 years. She is the classiest thing that I've ever met. Uh, she, you know, we, we have dinners together. She, we, we even spend Thanksgiving dinner together, but I never realized because when I was watching TV and the images that I see on TV, uh, whether it's reflected a lot of times in the music and various other things, I always looked at other people as those people it wasn't you know the, the colleague that I loved to death who was brilliant but I had a conversation with her and I never realized this that every day that she's at work when her son is 16 years old and he leaves the house she never knows if she'll ever see him again and and and, and it hits home to somebody to say um when you see enough of this and you start looking at the stats and listen I'm, I'm talking to a bunch of business people here we're number people we're numbers people when you see the stats and the facts of of, of these type of things, you start to say to yourself, I just didn't know. And even me being of color, I knew some of the things, but as I'm now educating myself more on it, you know, I, I'm starting to educate it. So it, uh, to educate myself more, I, I think it's really, really starting to come up with things to educate people. I mean, this is just, uh, and if you're just one person and you're saying, uh, what do I do? You got to look into it just like you were looking into any problem that you saw in your company or mentally, you know, that, that you, you that you have to to overcome these challenges. So so um, to some extent, you know, maybe uh, your life has evolved in a way that um, you've moved past problems uh, other people of color face every day. But I, I suspect sometimes not. Are the, is there an example you could share with us where? where um, despite your success, despite your wealth, you, you have felt judged in that way? Well, you gotta understand that my, my challenges of being judged that way is nothing to my challenges of when I grew up. When I, I was at the end of a, a, a police officer's gun probably four times, I've been called the N-word by, you know, probably about 50 times growing up. Uh, and when we grow up in neighborhoods, whether it's uh, you get on the bus and the bus driver happens to be white and then a problem happens and then he calls a white cop, they both are superior to you no matter who you are. Um, so I've had those challenges in my life, all my life. I mean, but as, uh, you know, as, as the Shark Tank guy and the FUBU guy, I've still had the, you know, the, the, they look at me a certain way until they realize who I am. Um, most recently, a, a very big drug chain, uh, you know, said, uh, uh, that, uh, you know, I was talking about hypertension and diabetes and things like that. And we were negotiating some kind of way for me to bring awareness to some of these things because the ones who suffer the most, as we've seen from COVID, are African-Americans. But they said, uh, you know, they said 
Damon John, we love him on Shark Tank, but his FUBU brand doesn't fit our store and we don't have those type of people coming in our store. Um, but will I, will I look at that as, as bad as when I was in the streets and I thought the cop was going to kill me and all I was was a kid with T-shirts trying to reach the stars? No, it's not. Okay, that's fine. I'll move on from that drugstore to another drugstore. So I am privileged and I am fortunate enough. However, I, I do have employees and friends that I do hear of their children being incarcerated or dying uh, probably once a year. And it still hurts because, like, you know, I, I was raised with these people. You know, I was raised with the, these are my family. This is my family. Yeah, and I, and I think that's, that's the place where um, not having a wide enough circle, not maybe knowing people of color is, is problematic, right? Um, because um, we don't have the same level of empathy. One place that you experienced um, some, uh, uh, some difficulty uh, getting back to business was f financing. And when you tried originally to finance FUBU, right? I, I think you right. went to... 20 some odd banks. 27, 27 banks. 27 um, banks, right? And, and not, none, of them, <laughs> none of them said yes. None of them said yes. Um, but I, 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 don't want, I don't want to pass the buck here. I did not have, and I can touch back on where we are today. I didn't have enough knowledge um, to fill out, uh, you know, um, a loan the right way. So I wouldn't have gave myself the money either. But, but where does this come from? It comes from, remember, African Americans do not have generational wealth. So our grandfather and our grandparents didn't have uh, generational wealth to teach us financial intelligence down the ladder. So I never knew what part of, you know, where to go. And because you feel that you're always looked down upon, you felt, you, you, traditionally, you felt that the banks were really against you. They're going to seize your assets or do things of that nature. So Again, it goes back to that. The American dream is pretty simple. You know, it is you will promise to get a job at a certain time when our grandparents were alive and one, one person could stay home, the other could work. You could go buy a home. Your equity, equity would build in that home over a course of time. And then you would pull that equity out um, and or sell the home and then move to Florida and you retire. <laughs> but, but the American dream is not that, cool, that great for African Americans. Why? Because first of all, if you financial institutions do not loan you money, and then even when you work someplace, you are averaging 20% less than your same counterpart, you don't make enough money. And even if you did, you still can't get a loan. So what are you doing? You're using that money to pay for other people because you're renting at a certain amount of time and you can never pull out that amount of equity uh, that you would like. So again, if we're talking about the banking system, that's where it starts. And I know a lot of people right now are going, holy crap. You know, I, 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 I didn't realize that. And again, going back to incarceration, if you can't get a loan, you can't get a job, and then you can't vote. But then people start to say, uh, you can't, you, you're not, can't vote and you can't serve on a jury well then who are they going to pick for the jury when if most of the african-american males have been through the system they're going to pick a, a a jury of people who are not your peers so i know people's head may be about to blow up right now but the, one of the stats are that um uh as of today uh it, it was more likely that in the slave days that a person would grow up with both their parents together of color than today. It was more likely that in slave days, a person would be able to, uh, a child will grow up with both their parents uh, uh, than today. So these stats and these facts are out there and they could, they're, they're mind blowing and mind boggling, but what can people who we're talking to today who care about, what can they do just today? Yes, absolutely. A very simple step, you know what I mean? A step of kindness, a step of wanting to educate themselves. Um. So, so education, um, maybe just being a human being might be one. Yeah, being human. I, I mean, that, that's what it is, listening. We, st we, we forgot to listen to people. We forgot to listen to the women. We forgot to listen to the African-American. We forgot to listen to the whites. You know, listening is on both sides. You know, it, it is, it is uh, you know, uh, my father left when I was 10. My stepfather, who would happen to come into my life when I was 16, I call on my stepdad happens to be of the Jewish faith. And I, you know, I learned something very important from him. You know, love doesn't come in a color or a gender. And I also learned that white people have their own issues as well. You see, in our community, 
We thought white people walk on water. We thought they don't have a problem. You know, when black people are in the store, everything's free for them, right? They don't get sick. They don't have, no, they have all the same issues. We all have more in common than we do apart. We all want, we all want to work an honest day's living. We all want to be able to be loved, you know, and truly appreciate love. We never want to be judged unfairly. We want to worship who we want to worship and we want to make sure we give our family every single thing that they ever wanted that we didn't have. Mm -hmm. So c communication, incredibly important. Or Orion Brown, who's in the audience today, wanted to know what, what other meaningful changes we could make right now, or what, maybe what your, what meaningful changes you plan as a company. So for example, um, how do we change the investment culture, given what it is right now? If, if Challenging. you get money at a bank, right? How, how, what are we gonna do? How do, how do we oh, if you work if you're working at a bank, um, there's going to be a lot of organizations. There are a lot of organizations that are out there on the front line. I would I would say if I was a bank, I'd probably go to the Chamber of Commerce first, who would who are touching the uh, local entrepreneurs every single day. Um, of course, couldn't there could if you're one of the bigger banks, could you create a fund where you do uh, um, you do create a fund for women businesses, veteran-owned businesses, and uh, African American businesses where it's an investment. It's not charitable work. You are vetting and you are trying to make the best investment. You know, I don't want this to be a charity for anybody. When I got with my partners, we realized that, uh, you know, together collectively, um, black and white, we made green, simple as that. And we made money and we made change by doing so. So we don't, you know, nobody wants a handout. So how do you find and how do you get the best pool of people that you can invest in? that you will make money because you'll want to do that more. You'll want to hire more people. If you just give the money away as charitable, it's fine. But, you know, again, you know, that's the old theory, right? You, you, you give a man a fish, he eats for a day. You, you teach him how to fish, he, you know, he, he eats for life. So let, let's talk about that a little bit. And, and I don't, you know, I don't want you to sit back in your shark tank, tank chair in, in, entirely. But um, aside from filling out the loan application correctly, which you, you once didn't know how to do, right? right. What, what other things should we expect uh, that will help people who are running businesses of color? What would we urge them to do right now to improve the odds of getting their business off the ground, having their business succeed, getting through the other side of whatever um, the COVID crisis holds for us? Yeah, well, it's going to be the basics of financial intelligence and, um, you know, and that starts way before they become a business owner. You know, financial intelligence is extremely important and most people, and I'm not talking about just people of color, most people just don't have it, right? So um, how do you go into the communities and give them financial intelligence? You know, if you look, look at somebody in the community who doesn't realize that they should go to a bank, they're paying, I don't know, what is it, 8% at a check cash in place? You know, think about paying 8% of your salary at a check cashing place, right? And then they're leveraging their credit cards. So now they're at 18% on their, on their credit card loans. I mean, they're already starting out of the gate, you know, bad. Um, so financial intelligence is, is something that should be given to the community earlier. You know, our, 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 um, our teaching institutions are somewhat broken um, because of a lot of different changes over the, over the, over the years. But they're going to have to adjust now because they're seeing how they can add value with people at home. But if I, if our, if our education system doesn't teach people financial intelligence, then what happens when you turn 16 or 18 years old and you know that you can borrow $300,000? If you don't understand how to, that, how that really operates, then you may, you know, like most, most professionals, they don't, they don't pay off their school loans sometimes until they're 45 years old. And if the stats have shown that today, 50% of the kids that are graduating will retire with a title of a job that doesn't even exist today. So now you, cause you don't have financial intelligence, you believe that college was a thing you should do. And I'm not saying it isn't, but then you went out and took a massive loan of $300,000 for an education that you don't know if you, you ever need. You know, so again, this all goes back to the, the basics of the fundamentals of when people are early stage, I mean, you know, like just getting out into the world, you know, 8, 10, 11, 12, 15, you know. Uh, think about right now, if I told you uh, uh, 15 years ago, your son or your daughter, that you're going to be a drone operator or a social media, uh, uh, you know, expert, you'd be like, what is that? <laughs> right? So again, 
you know, it, it goes back to every one of our conversations is going to somehow go back to listening and education and taking small steps to work it out. Uh, you know, and that's just the way I look at entrepreneurship. So uh, edu education is important, but um, maybe not university level education with the burden of, of, of financing four years of school. I, I'm well, only, 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 I, I believe that everybody should go and get financial intelligence, whether you're a business uh, degree as well, whether you're getting it online through books or colleges, if that's up to you, please listen. If you're going to be a doctor and you're going to start cutting people open, please go to school. I mean, don't do that one from a book. <laughs> um, but, you know, all I'm saying is that the, the basics of where we all have challenges come from our understanding of funding and financing. You know what I mean? So if you, if you have unhealthy habits, whether it's nutrition or whether it's finance, you're going to, that's going to manifest and become worse. Yeah. And, and I think actually we rob um, the American economy of a lot of opportunity um, because of that. Right. So I, I, I teach uh, entrepreneurship um, and innovation at a university. Um, I have students that have terrific ideas. All of those students, when they graduate, go to work at a big consulting firm because they have $150,000 of student debt, right? And that big consulting firm aren't the businesses uh, like the ones that you've started that have really led to something, led to growth, right? They're about, right. let's cut the fat out of someplace. They're not about, not, not about the growth opportunity. Yeah, that's true. I mean, but, but you know, listen, I'm, I'm never against, you know, I can't tell anybody what their path is sure. going to be. That's a very personal decision. Um, and, Sometimes I see people go to school and they say, I, I went to it for a year and I want to realize what I don't want to do. Sometimes I've seen people go to school and say, you know, I want to study sociology or I want to study something else that you do need to go to school for. I want to, I want to help people in a different way. So I'm not anti-school. I am just, you just need to have uh, financial intelligence. And going back to African-Americans, uh, you know, when they're starting businesses, African Americans have always started businesses, but they, you know, we called it a hustle, but we're all working with each other. But, you know, a lot of times that they don't know how to build a business and the structure, if the foundation, I mean, you're a professor, you know, if the foundation is weak, it's going to fall. You know, if, if it's not, you know, if, if your books aren't in order, your financing aren't in order, if you're a DBA or a trademark or this or that, you're legal, you know, then the finance, you know, if you start off weak like that, especially when times like this come around, I don't care how many times we've heard about the, 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 the rock star companies that in one year, it takes still an average of five to seven years to become uh, somewhat get into your groove in your company. But if you're built on a weak foundation, how do you keep building on top? It's going to crumble just like a building. That's right. And even, even the companies um, with help from people like you still take five, five and seven years, right? I mean, you have companies in your portfolio. Absolutely. That, that have taken Absolutely. I've, I've seen very few companies that have started and uh, you know, really done super well in three years. I've seen them spike, and then something happened. You get too comfortable. You get caught with your hand in the cookie jar, and then all of a sudden you got to reset. Uh, you know, so so, but yeah, it still takes five so, or seven years, and you got to know the fundamentals. So one of, one of those companies, um, uh, Bombas, whose socks I even wear occasionally, um, yeah. has has part of uh, their structure a brand purpose about giving back, right? About donating product for every product sold. How important is that? Now we hear a lot of people talking about brand purpose, about giving back, about corporate social responsibility. How important do you think that is to a business? Well, you know, I'm gonna give you a typical example of still learning and educating ourselves. You know, when I went on Shark Tank, I already had, uh, this was during uh, 08, 09. And in my business, when things like this happen, clothes are the first thing that that the people stop buying because they just wear their shirt again and again and again um and so the last thing i ever wanted was another clothing company so because i already had 10 clothing companies at that time and eight of them were dead bombas comes on they pitch me i'm like oh this is never going to work they're socks how am i even going to put a logo on those things i would never know who who's wearing it plus they're found in buckets and by the way i got a million units of socks left in my warehouse, this is the last thing I need. I mean, the only way I could sell better socks at that time was I break into your house, I steal one of them, and you think you lost it in the laundry, and you come back and buy another <laughs> pair from me, right? So, so, um, uh, but what did I learn? You know, I learned that in business, a lot of times, and I think today this is the most important time to talk about it. I used to always think you had to make it, and this was the process. Then you master it, and then you find ways to matter. 
And today, especially in this climate, you can make it master and matter all at the same time. That's what Bombas is doing because for every pair of socks that they sell, they give away a pair to the homeless. Now, what did I learn from that? I learned that 20 years ago in business, I gave at the end of the, 15 years, 10 years ago, but I gave at the end of the year, I, I, I supported whatever causes I could. But now today's consumer, don't, they don't say I gave at the end of the year. They say, I gave 300 times. What are you talking about? Every time I bought this pair of socks, I helped the homeless. Every time I bought this bracelet, I cleaned up the ocean. Every time I did this, I stopped human trafficking. And they brag about it and they feel proud about it because the consumer today can buy from anybody. So they don't want to know what you're doing for them. They want to know what you're doing for anybody. And then you know what they do? They, they, they tell people at the water cooler on Monday morning. They have Sunday dinner and say, oh, you know what kind of socks I have on? These are called Bombas and they're, they're your biggest cheerleader. Mm -hmm. So I learned this lesson from them on how you can matter in business and how the consumer's mindset and buying habits have changed. Um, and they are the number one brand. Uh, they are the number one product ever invested in, in Shark Tank history, Bomba Socks. So uh, just make sure if you ever talk to any other underachievers called the fellow sharks that I reminded you of that. <laughs> Um, so, so, so you're, you're always learning as you just acknowledged, but that also means you've likely, um, made m mistakes. Um, I'm wondering what your sort of two or three biggest mistakes you're willing to share with us are. Today? The mistakes <laughs> I made today? Uh, um, two or three biggest mistakes. Um, uh, so in, in, your, I, in your career, right? In, in your, my career. In career. And my career is, um, I didn't know how numbers worked and I was so busy trying to, you know, get things done. And if you, if you really look, you know, I have a story about, you know, mortgage on my mother's house and, um, and took out a hundred thousand dollar loan and, um, now food was here. But, um, before I t took an ad in the paper and I ended up working with two really great, my company ended up working with two really great guys, Norman and Bruce Weissler from Samsung, uh, textile division. I now reflect and I know that a month, a month prior to that, a month, if that didn't happen, a month later, I would have been homeless. I would have lost my home. I would have lost my factory. I lost everything else. So that was my first understanding that I didn't have financial intelligence. But my second was that I probably blew about $20 million um, when I first made money because I just didn't know how money worked. Um, and I didn't take in, you know, taxes and this. And I wasn't buying the lavish things like the big, you know, the, the, the jets and all that other stuff. So so, so the crushing amount, you know, I would go into a market like, I would go into a market, 9-11 would happen, I would go in high, and then as soon as it bottomed out, I wouldn't hold. I wouldn't stay, I would be afraid, right? Mm -hmm. I would buy depreciating, uh, you know, I, I'll buy, uh, you know, um, liabilities instead of assets, right? Um, uh, so again, financial intelligence was almost killed me. You know, I remember somebody, one of my buddies saying, you know, you, you're sitting on a lot of cash, but that's a depreciating asset. And I said, what are you talking about? So, well, uh, if it was 1975, we put the hundred thousand dollars in the ground. I will leave that there. And if we bought a hundred thousand dollar stone, or just a diamond, we put them both in the ground today. You'd be able to be able to get a Mercedes Benz with the, with the hundred, hundred thousand dollars, excuse me, a hundred thousand dollars in cash. And the diamond would be worth $2 million. But me not knowing any better, I heard stones work out, but guess what I did? I bought, a, I bought a diamond crystal uh, Muhammad Ali piece. I go back to try to sell it because I thought jewelry was worth something, not stones. I spent $300,000 for it. The guy barely gave me, uh, you know, $30,000 for it. So financially, I, I, those, those were the big mistakes. Another financial one, when I did have financial intelligence was we invested in a company, uh, a, a very popular company and uh we spent about six million dollars investing in it because it, it was two the head designers were two amazing people and they used to get uh, naomi campbell and everybody walked down the runway for free and uh, stuff like that and they got all the hype so they looked to me like a young version of fubu but they were in the young women's market and i invested in them and we lost six million about six million dollars and here's why we lost six million dollars because we didn't know the business well enough. I didn't know how to make ladies clothes well enough and ready to wear. And these guys were great costume designers. So they would take Naomi Campbell and put a, I don't know, put a couple of pieces of paper on her and a garbage can on her head and push her out on the runway and everybody would talk about her. And oh my God, uh, this company was really amazing. But 
ready to wear female clothes are very different than male clothes. You know, you and I, uh, there, there's only two si sizes of men's, right? So there's either, you know, you wear a, a long or a short, you know, two thirty fours or 34, long and short. Okay, you can make it bag if you want. But women, because their clothes are so tight to their body, there's about 18 uh, different sizes of one size. So if one size 10, you got uh, the back buckets or the, you know, the crotch is too high, the crotch is too low, the thighs, this or that. The bottom line is, I thought that I can buy my way into the industry with hiring a bunch of people that I just thought knew what they were talking about. And I thought because I had money, I could throw money at the problem. And that was one of my biggest mistakes because I lost all the money and I lost a lot of time. Um, and the clothing business is notoriously um, hard one. One of the, um, um, I, I, I guess, sort of moments when you make mistakes is understanding when um, it's appropriate to pivot out of the mistake. And there's a question from uh, Harry Kelman um, who says, uh, congrats from a fellow Bayside High student. I'm so sorry. Right. Bayside uh, High. Um, who wants to know how you know as an entrepreneur um, uh, when you're just being stubborn, um, when you're sort of got the vision, and which is right and when really it's time to pivot. Something we've heard a lot about in the last two or three months, business is pivoting. Yeah, so, you know, you got to take inventory of what you have, right? And that, that's the only thing you can control, whether it's a, a, a virus or planes crashing in the building or something like that. You know, what can you control? And so what do you have? You have how much time on your hands, how much cash to death, how much of a staff do you have? Um, more importantly, what's in your contacts and Rolodex? Who can you call to collaborate with or to joint venture with or do something like that? Um, and then you have to look at the fundamentals of business. It's pretty simple, right? Business is uh, decreased costs or increased sales, right? How are you profitable? Uh, then, you're all, then you're looking at what is your customer profile? And there's only three ways to deal with a customer. You acquire a new one, you upsell a current one, or you make one uh, buy more frequently. Acquiring a new one is much harder, right, than making to upsell one or to make one buy more frequently. Then you know, look at another side of your business. Why are people buying things from you? What is the messaging out to them? Uh, and you put it all together. I mean, I, I, I can't give you a, a, a very detailed answer on it because I don't know the first business. Um, so, but those are the challenges. You have to look into your inventory and see what you have. You know, if you are right now in a high touch business, such as a gym or a spa, you know, uh, you know, uh, listen, what I, gyms are starting to open up now, but what I did with somebody about three months ago is I said, why don't you, all your members, why don't you rent out their, give them the equipment and, and then do the Peloton version out of your home, right? And then you also know the stores in the neighborhood, those stores that sell uh, athleisure where they're not getting any foot traffic. You ask them because their inventory is getting old. Can you offer all my members 35 to 40% off? Um, and I'll make also, you give me 5%. And they said, absolutely. So the members felt good because they're getting 35 to 40% off. They're extending their, uh, you know, their, uh, the, the store is extending their, mem you know, their owners, uh, excuse me, their sort of customers. And this guy's retaining his members. So he did that also with a juice company and other things. So you, you got to find ways to collaborate to, to, to help grow that business. But, you know, you got to look at it. You got to peel the Band-Aid off and really look at the wound and see how long you have. Uh, that, that, that explanation you just gave, the examples, you just, it felt like there was a little bit of the Hollis hustle in there. Like, that doesn't come naturally to everyone, right? Like, this, this ability to connect those dots from, uh, where did that come from for you? You know, well, first of all, my mentor is a guy named Jay Abraham. Um, I think you know Jay. But um, I just look at the assets. I, it's called the power of growth. What assets do you have? You, everybody has assets here. They're not just using their Slack assets. And because we grew up in the theory that you had to have money to make money, but collaborations have been done for many, many years. We see collaborations with music artists. We see it with food companies. We see it all the time. You know, we looked at recently what, what happened. I think, was it Hyatt or somebody like that? I think Hyatt. Or, 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 you know, when they had to lay up a lot of their staff, I think they, they did a collaboration or whatever you want to call it. Their asset was their highly trained staff. They, 
they they uh they worked out something with either Walgreens or CVS where that staff can go there and work. And now they know that at least they uh you know they didn't have to furlough the people or let them go, and that CVS or whoever it was wouldn't poach them when times come back, and they get to keep their staff, and their staff gets to be able to feed their families. And CVS or Walgreens, or whatever it is doesn't have to have a high turnover because of all the people they need now in the store because they know this is a highly skilled staff. Uh, it can be done so many different ways. And I, I, I just always have learned to just use my Slack resources first because that's what I have. So I, I think that's something that more businesses are discovering now, right? In the last three or four months uh, in the time of COVID it is this collaboration. Do you think that's something um, that's going to stick with us? That, that That business doesn't have to be a a zero sum cutthroat game that collaboration can actually be real effective. Absolutely. For, for absolutely. Listen, the, the world has absolutely changed. This is like us after nine 11 thinking that we were going to go through the airport the same exact way. And you got to look at your advantages right now. And I've been telling people this, you know, um, two months ago or three months ago, you would have called somebody up and, you know, you would have called me up and I would have been on a plane, train, automobile, or, you know, we have this activation going or this, we're doing this. And it's really not the time. Or, Scott, I really want to talk to you, but it's really not the time. Or let's get back to that or let's meet later. You know exactly where I am now, Scott. I'm on the couch eating Cheetos <laughs> with my remote control, arguing with my significant other, looking for ways to get the hell out of here. You know where all of your potential, uh, you know, uh, customers are, your uh, collaborations are. Uh, look at right now, what if you're out there trying to um, uh, go out and raise funding? You don't have to fly all over the place. You can find all of your investors on Zoom right now, and you could probably knock out nine meetings a day instead of nine meetings a month. So, you know, this is the time you have to do that. And again, I'm just the guy that I see the glass is always over full. It's just beautiful because I can't, I can't stop any of that other stuff going on. So you got to, you got to start doing it. So, you gotta so start collaborating. So, um, uh, pandemic, uh, marching in the streets, and still really a good time to start a business if that business, I suspect, has the right fundamentals. The right fundamentals, and there are so many other businesses now that you may want to invest in that you see, you see that really the pandemic brought to light. I'll give you an example. These kids come on the show last season called Moves. Sneakers with the bottoms that come off and they say, you know, like my wife, I can't come in the house with my, with my shoes on. She makes me take my shoes off. And you go, okay, that's cool. After the pandemic happened, massive amount of delivery type of or installation companies are calling them like Best Buy. like, I need this for my staff because when they go into somebody's house, they got to take their shoes off because people worried about COVID, right? So you're going to see a lot of stuff. And this is the best time to be creative. Also, there are people right now watching who work someplace who said, I'm tired of working on somebody else's dream. You know, I, I, I see what just happened. I, I got to start my own dream. Suddenly right? life seems too short. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's what's happened. Listen, me, one of the resources that I didn't say that, that people should do is I asked my staff, what should we do? I said, please raise your hand if there's something that you've been wanting to do, an initiative or something else that you haven't gotten to or we never acknowledge you because the whole reason I hired you is you're smarter than me, right? And, you know, I play Batman and my staff, staff is Robin, but most of the time I'm Robin, they're Batman because I hired them because they're younger and smarter than me or some of them are older and smarter than me. And, you know, one or two people raised their hand and said, hey, you know, I've been asking you to do this. For, you know, I have an idea and they told me the idea and I said, why didn't you ever tell me this? They said, I did, you moron, about 30 times. You didn't listen to me. So, you know, some people, some people are going to be able to, right now, they're going to be able to get to the top of their company because they're going to be worth so much and knowledge and they know the company. You know, so, listen, it's just such an opportune time. I mean, you probably know better than I did. What happened in 08, 09? What came out of 08, 09? Uber, uh, Venmo, Square. It was like, Pinterest, these companies were made in 09. Yeah. 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 So, so, so there's a way, but, but all those people have in place the things um, that you've already sort of advocated for the, the uh, uh, numeracy, literacy, right? The, the financial literacy. Um, a I can't say they always listen. I can't say they always do because, you know, things change and you keep learning. You got to keep learning, but they have the fundamentals. Well, at least they know they need the fundamentals. If they don't know they need the fundamentals, I mean, if they don't have the fundamentals, 
They have mentors around them. They have a board around them. They have advisors around them. Uh, uh, you know, that's the smartest thing, you know, to do is always have a mentor. I mean, you know, that's the number one reason why people are successful, I believe, is mentors. Um, and that's an opportunity as well, right? I, I, in this time, I feel like people are much more amenable to giving a little bit of their time to, to mentor, to have a conversation like we're having and you sharing your knowledge with our audience at Inc.com right now. Um, that, that seems yeah, absolutely. That, that seems new and, and important. What, um, was it a mentor or something inside of you that made you decide um, uh, after FUBU was successful that you could do more than that, that, ju that just wasn't who you were, that that wasn't going to be your business forever? Only you know, I think it was a little bit of that healthy paranoia. You know, I looked at the numbers and I realized that 99% of clothing brands that are great last only five to seven years. And, uh, you know, we have, you have your unicorns such as the Ralph Lorenz or the Nikes of the world, but more than likely I needed to um, pivot again. And then I checked my inventory and I realized my inventory wasn't that I was a great designer. Listen, I, I smacked a big boo boo or a 05 on a jersey. Not that hard, um, um, but I realized why my assets were that I knew how to market. I had all these entertainers that I kind of had worked with. I had distribution and I had manufacturing. So I started to acquire different brands uh, to give it a go um, to utilize that pipeline. Again, upsell a current customer. I wanted to go to Macy's and say, uh, you know, I'm taking up space in this area, but now I have a skateboard brand, right? So that was what I wanted to do. Um, then I also had felt that I had a need to, to really be transparent about entrepreneurship because I noticed that a lot of my friends were living a dream and they were, and they, it was actually a nightmare because they, they were mentally, they were fatigued. They were trying to outdo everybody and act like they have so much money and this and that who are entrepreneurs. And I said, why is everybody painting entrepreneurship as such this one way when we know that it's very, very hard to be an entrepreneur, extremely hard. And I said, you know, I, I want to just be very honest with people. So I, that's when I started writing the books and want to go out and teach people because as entrepreneurs, we've seen this already with Anthony Bourdain and Kate Spade that, um, you know, before this, all this stuff ever happened, entrepreneurs have nobody to talk to. They can't tell their staff that they're, they're one month away from uh, closing the door because your staff would say, wait a minute, the boss is, crying they're upset I, I gotta leave you know i don't have a job here you know everybody else thinks you walk on water and your staff tells you all their problems you can't tell them your problem you go home you have financial stress going on and then stuff like this happens and i realized that that's that's what maybe my calling for two things number one to show people that a little a little brown boy who's dyslexic who got left back in school can make it who i didn't know anything about sports or music and if i can make it anybody can make it and number two is that entrepreneurship is not that easy and you shouldn't be ashamed of it and you should talk to people. You know, so I started to do that and lo and behold, I wrote books. So now I had the combination of uh, investing in other companies because I knew FUBU was going to, you know, to play its, its time and its course. I had the feeling, I had the wanting to back, so I started to broadcast and go on interviews and write books. And then Shark Tank comes around. Yeah. Uh, so all of it came out of doing things that uh, you know, all of it came out of doing things that I just really felt passionate about, but I never just jumped fully into it. Even with FUBU, I worked at Red Lobster at night and FUBU during the daytime for five years, right? And I, I had FUBU and I was, huh? I was just going to say, I think that's a really yeah. important thing for people to hear that you, yeah. you worked in a restaurant for five years at night to see the dream uh, of your business during the day. And, and that's something that gets so glossed over in sort of entrepreneurial. Yeah, all that, all that go like, hard right? and this and that crap. Are you kidding me? The only way you go hard is to uh, put about 20% of the time in the area you want to go, but you got to keep the lights on and do what you need to do today. Right. And, and that's just, just what I did. Listen, I worked at Red Lobster for five years. I rented out the rest of my house to strangers. I had sewing machines downstairs in the basement. Um, and I literally slept three night, three hours every single night. But if I didn't work at Red Lobster for five years, I made $30,000 a year, which is not a lot of money, but that equated after five years to $150,000. I had medical benefits. I was taking all the food home at the end of the night that wasn't cooked. And I was now I had free food and I was using the staff in Red Lobster 
to help me on the weekends at the flea market. I would have had to do $2 million in FUBU business to have come away with that same stuff. And by the way, I was Airbnb in my house before Airbnb was out. I would rent it out to total strangers for uh, $40, a week, uh, $40 a week per room. So now I was having them help me uh, pay my, my, my mortgage. And I just had to do that. And I did the same sacrifices, but not as, as bad, you know, later on in my career. I would just, where I really wanted to go, I would put a little bit of time in that while, uh, you know, paying attention to my core business. That, that has got to be the textbook definition uh, of, of hustle right there, d doing um, <laughs> what, what you just described. And then just to get back to it, having a mortgage on your mother's house to be the emotional um, sort of burden that you're carrying is, is, is pretty uh, pretty astonishing um, and ultimately to me uh, remarkably inspiring and um, one of the reasons I think you're a person um, who can maybe give us a little insight uh, into the future right so I'm gonna ask you just a couple of questions what what do you imagine um, uh, the next uh, three months uh, uh, being like in, in in our economy based on everything you've seen and knowing what entrepreneurs are capable of um, where are we going to be three months from now? You know, you're asking me a lot of stuff that's way above my pay grade, <laughs> but you know, um, I think we're going to, I think entrepreneurs are, there's going to be a, uh, many are going to fall by the wayside because even if their businesses come back, such as restaurants, they can only house a certain amount of people in there, yeah. probably half the people as before. So you're going to see a lot fall by the wayside. Uh, you're going to see a good portion of people adjust and adapt. They may reduce their imprint um, or, you know, or find better ways to service online and understand that they need social media and they need to use that powerful tool. Um, but they're not going to be able to be overnight successes on social media because like anything, it's not that easy, not just putting up a post and it's going to happen. And then you're going to see some really rock star businesses, uh, you know, just explode. Um, you know, because they're going to be people who may have been selling workout equipment or backyard equipment and uh, they were always online, but now all of a sudden they have mass amount of inventory and a lot of people who are going to do uh, collaborations or any kind of broker dealer, broker deals with them are going to, you know, they're going to, they're going to create the pipeline to, to them. So uh, I think that's what's going to happen over the next three months. Um, and I just, you know, the, the, the big, the big, you know, billion dollar question is, will a second wave come back and disrupt a lot of the people who will make it over the three months, but aren't on solid ground. Yeah. And that, that's going to be the, the billion dollar question. And I, and I think that that's one we will um, have little insights into and we'll, we'll grapple with going forward. Um, you mentioned social media. Um, FUBU was sort of an original social media brand before there was yeah. social media, right? Um, how do you modulate the uh, uh, messaging you give in a time when things are so difficult for so many people? Whether um, you know that has to do with racial injustice, whether it has to do with the uh, effects of a, a, a stumbling economy and being out of work, whether it has to do with you know someone's health and well-being. How, how do you make the messaging of your business right now? Well, you got to go back to what your core. And thank you for saying messaging, because remember, I'm dyslexic. I never went to college. So I never really heard the word modulate. <laughs> um, but I appreciate it. You're saying messaging. Okay, no problem. I can get that one. Um, you know, what is the core and the fundamentals of your business? What were you in the business for? You know, uh, what was your promise to, and to over deliver to your customer? I was doing really a great, uh, I was having a great conversation with a, a, a owner of a restaurant who was, um, who was, you know, I think second or third generation. And he was like, we're in the hospitality business. Who cares about a steak? You know, we, 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 we sold high end or, or, or very, you know, you know, uh, food and now we're making comfort food. And he said, because the core of our business has never been the food has been the experience because you're only going to have one mother's day. When you walk in here, you're only going to have your daughter's birthday at 16 years old. And we are, we are opening our doors to make you feel comfortable and promise you that you're going to have that special moment of your time. And the food is a afterthought of what we're trying to really give you. You're con you're conversing over food this is a special moment that you will never necessarily have and even if you are hungry and you came in there we're going to give you the best special moment of being when you're hungry 
And as I go back to FUBU and what we were founded off of, and a lot of time people misunderstood FUBU because they thought it was only uh, for people of color and it wasn't. We were very, very inclusive. We wanted people to, whoever loved hip hop music, because I would, I would dress the Beastie Boys and whoever, uh, you know, what is the core value? It is for us by us. It is communities coming together and being of inclusive. It is what we're looking at in the streets today. People of all colors saying, we are about this one movement. So people right now who have a brand, what is your brand? Is it making somebody, you know, cry or laugh or sleep better at night or, you know, get scare them, whatever it is, go, you got to go back to the core and what your customer really wants. You have to be obsessed with your customer. You just really have to be obsessed with your customer. I think that's the best thing that entrepreneurs do. A lot of times they don't have these big visions, but a true entrepreneur does the best they can do for their customer today and wakes up tomorrow and does the best thing they can do for their customer tomorrow. So what are your core uh, beliefs and what are your customer's core beliefs and how can you uh, make sure you over provide for them? Listen to them too. A lot of times right now, ask your customer how they're doing and see what's up. Don't, don't think about a mon uh, mon monetizing. That's not important right now. It's, it's, it's important to be there because that customer has been there for you. Um, that's terrific advice and uh, inspiring. And it, it leads me to um, the last, not exactly a question, but uh, a, a note from a man in the audience named uh, Martin Robinson, who um, said, uh, inspiration uh, for me comes from uh, being inspired, uh, Damon. And you inspired me. We go way back to an event you were speaking at. Um, and I managed to get you, uh, help get you off the stage. Um, and we talked for a while. Um, and uh, in that talk, you inspired me to uh, never give up on my dreams. I just want to thank you for that uh, now. Um, I suspect wow. that um, Martin, Martin Robinson, who, who wrote that, um, is not the only person uh, feeling that way right now, given what you've had to say today to our audience. So I just want to um, thank you for being here um, and let you know that uh, we appreciate it so much and to hear from you was uh, really wonderful today. Well, it was great. Thank you so much. And, you know, just in, in closing, I just think that, uh, you know, everybody, you know, don't beat yourself up too much, you know, uh, take it slow and understand what's going out there on out there. Don't also play a position just to say, well, look, I did this, you know, really care. If you really care about it, people will see it. It will come through. Um, but take care of your family and, you know, and, and, and start the dialogue. Um, and, uh, you know, listen, we're going to get through this. Even if you're an entrepreneur right now, sometimes you may need to close the business so you can start over a little more wisely, uh, and reset. Um, don't live for everybody else. Live for just you and your family and, uh, uh, and, and make sure that you're just a good human being. And that's all we can really ask of people. So, uh, I really thank you for this platform, Scott, and thank you for all the love that you've given me. Um, I don't see too many, to be very honest. I don't see too many. Uh, I see athletes and, 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 uh, and actors and um, uh, musicians on covers. I don't see too many um, men or women of color uh, on covers. I've been on two. I've been in the magazine countless times. Um, so, you know, it really shows that you and the entire family, uh, you know, um, and Tennille and everybody, because she's, she's great and everybody's great. It, and Eric, it shows that you guys believe in, 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 in entrepreneurship, no matter what color. And, the reason why I do Shark Tank is the thing I love about Shark Tank is when you stand on that carpet, couldn't care less about your color, your height, your sexual preference, your religion. It just gives you that shot. And everybody listening to us right now, they're taking that shot. And I appreciate it. Thanks so much, Damon. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, everyone in the audience as well for joining us today. Um, there are more Inc. Real Talks coming up, and you can visit and register for those webinars um, and the Q&A sessions that come with them uh, at the address below. Our next um, is tomorrow with Steve Case, uh, the chairman and CEO of Revolution, um, the co-founder of a company you might have recalled, uh, AOL, and, and author of the book, The Third Wave. That's tomorrow, Wednesday, June 10th at 1 p.m. Eastern time. Um, and the registration uh, URL for that is below, or you can find it by going to inc.com. Um, thanks very much for joining us today.